Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Once upon a time, there might have been 60 million bison on the North American continent. The herds were so large that they covered prairies like immense horizon-stretching black cloaks, and their annual migrations carved such wide paths into the landscape that some were turned into roads by human travelers. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at the National Parks Traveler. As vast as bison herds were, the species came extremely close to extinction. By the end of the 19th century, there might have been two dozen bison left in the wilds, and they were deep in the heart of Yellowstone National Park. Today, however, there might be 500,000 bison in North America, though most are in commercial herds, meant for meat production. Designated the national mammal back in 2016, bison are truly charismatic megafauna. So charismatic, in fact, that Dayton Duncan and Ken Burns, who profiled America's national parks back in 2016, are soon to release a documentary on the history of the bison. We'll be back in a minute with Dayton to discuss this fascinating project. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people, inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference too at friendsofacadia.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. The Everglades Foundation, the only organization whose sole mission is to restore and protect America's Everglades. Learn more at evergladesfoundation.org. Do you work or volunteer for the National Park Service? Are you retired from the Department of the Interior? Learn how you could earn $250 by joining Interior Federal Credit Union and opening up a new credit card. Visit their website for membership details and how to join. Federally insured by NCUA. Welcome to The Traveler, Dayton. No, it's good to be here. Thanks. Hey, I, I really appreciate it. I've got to ask you right off the bat, why bison? What attracted you to this animal and, and say, not the passenger pigeon? Well, it's a topic uh, that I personally have been captivated, uh, almost obsessed with for about 40 years. And Ken and I uh, touched on the, on the topic in various segments in some previous films on our film on the West back in 1996, we talked about the hide hunters and the destruction of the herds uh, in the 1870s and 1880s. In my book out West uh, about retracing the Lewis and Clark trail. And then our film uh, 10 years later in 1997 about the core of discovery, Lewis and Clark expedition. We touch about how immense the herds were and how important they were actually to the uh, to the explorers as they cross what's now Montana. When we did our film on the national parks, as you mentioned in 2016, uh, we dealt with it in terms of Yellowstone being what George Bird Grinnell called the last refuge, not only for bison but for a lot of other large uh, animals and how they almost uh, were poached out of existence there. And the law that finally gave the, the park uh, regulations some actual teeth uh, that finally helped bring them you know, back from, from the edge. But we wanted, uh, my, my, my thought was, we should just do the whole thing, you know? And in doing that deeper dive, I think sort of new, but, but actually came to understand it even more profoundly what a story that is of this uh, animal. And in following it, it takes us into a lot of corners of uh, American history that are important to know. Uh, there's a lot of different corners to it about who we are as a nation, but also 
this 10,000 year connection that native people had with the American buffalo, how deep that was, how important that was, and therefore the near extermination of all of them from the face of the earth, how profoundly tragic that was to, you know, to not obviously to the species, but, but equally to the native people. Uh, and that's principally our first uh, episode. Our second episode, which another reason that I think this is an important story is that it, ha- it teaches us lessons today too. We make choices as a nation. And as we did with national parks, we, we showed that we are capable of making choices to stop destruction of the natural world if we can finally get the courage to do it and convince our political leaders to wake up to it. And uh, that's part of the story of uh, the American buffalo as well. You know, you mentioned the whole thing, and there really are so many threads to this story. I mean, as I mentioned in the introduction, once upon a time, bison covered the landscape. It could take hours for herds to cross a river, and, you know, they blocked the wagon trains coming west, and eventually they blocked the the railroads coming west. Mm. Um, As you mentioned, the ties to the indigenous cultures, the military's view that killing bison served as a means of forcing tribes onto reservations, a view shared at the time by the Interior Secretary. And that's just the the mid-1800s. It's just, uh, you know, so much material that you had to work with. Well, you know, that's what we do. We we love taking on a, 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 a big topic, if we can, and also sometimes concentrate on a specific moment in history. But in this case, we're covering 10,000 years of of history and try to tell it as a story, try to be as accurate as we can, try to keep the story moving, uh, but also be clear-eyed about what our history is. And so just as in telling the story of the near extermination of the American buffalo, in the story which I found equally interesting uh, of the different people who we can thank for individually doing their bit to save them from extinction. A lot of times with uh, with not the best of motives. So it's it's an interesting uh, sort of American amalgam of people from those who are trying to save a few bison and start herds to crossbreed them with cattle to Buffalo Bill Cody, who wanted to have a herd so that he could take them and show fascinated people in the East and Europe what a, what a buffalo looked like in real life, to a rancher Charles Goodnight, who thought, well, maybe there's a you know a, a business here in raising them, to some native people uh, on reservations in South Dakota and Montana who were doing it more out of the tradition that this is part of our our life, to people like George Bird Grinnell, who I think uh, to me is one of my uh, personal conservation heroes, who saw them as one of the few at that time who really understood that it was there's two parts to this. It's the saving the natural world from destruction, but also its connection to native people. The taxidermist at the Smithsonian uh, Institution who went out in the 1880s to when he heard that the buffalo are about to disappear, he rushed out there so he could kill 24 of them uh, to make, um, you know, an exhibit of it. But um, and that but that was out of, uh, you know, sort of an oddly correct, I guess, motivation that they're about to disappear forever. And if generations from now people are ever going to see what a uh, buffalo looked like when they existed, They would have his uh, exhibit to thank. And then, of course, the guy who became the greatest conservation president in the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, also rushed west around the same time in the 1880s when he heard they're about to disappear because he wanted to kill one so he could mount the head on his, you know, the wall of his home in Sagamore Hill as proof that here's another big animal that I've killed who then became, I think, with George Bird Grinnell's sort of guidance, 
the great conservation president that he went. Dirk, you know, um, in terms of those motivations, Theodore Roosevelt, as a young man, when he rushed west to kill uh, a buffalo for a trophy head, then bought a ranch in North Dakota, which changed his life and his perspective as a American, uh, but also wrote a book about it in which he said, well, it's this slaughter of the uh, of the buffalo is uh, is a tragedy, of, I guess, in certain respects, but really it was the best thing for, quote, civilization. It was required in his mind to solve what they called the Indian problem at the time. Right. Um, that's a long journey from that, from him writing that to him then signing the executive orders to create the first wildlife refuges uh, to restore bison to the Wichita Mountains in uh, Oklahoma and then out to the National Bison Range in Montana and for him to join with Grinnell in the 1890s to help protect the, you know, that dwindling herd, the last and only at that moment free ranging herd of buffalo in the world. Uh, which had dwindled down to, as you mentioned, about a couple of a dozen. So that's a that's an interesting journey for him. And some of the others have that interesting journey um, as well. And so we try to bring all of those characters to life. A, a multimillionaire who founded the Long Island Railroad in Coney Island, Austin Corbin, had a lavish um, sort of exotic game preserve here in New Hampshire. And he had, you know, uh, wild boar from the Bavarian forests and uh, caribou and Himalayan goats and stuff like that. But he also had a, a small buffalo herd that grew to 160. And, and that turned out to be an important, you know, element of it all. So that notion, to me, it echoes what the national park idea in the national park stories is that much of the stuff that we now take for granted, we shouldn't take for granted. We can thank individuals or small organizations for most of the national parks. Uh, and it, the federal government usually comes late to the game. And that was true of the bison as well. It was these individual efforts that kept enough of them just and just enough to keep them from disappearing forever, but it finally coalesced into something of a national movement that then saved them from uh, the brink of extinction. Well, let me ask you about that, Dayton. It was just a small handful of people and um, individuals who, as you noted, went out to kill Buffalo. Yeah. I mean, Roosevelt went out to kill Buffalo. Hornaday, we got to kill them before they're gone. Uh, Charles Goodnight um, wanted to get rid of them because uh, they were eating up valuable grass for his cattle herds. Buffalo Jones, um, boy, there's a character. You could do a whole book on him. And, yeah. Um, but he turned around to to want to go to Yellowstone. To He was the game manager, basically, at Yellowstone for a while to, to build back the bison herds. What, what turned them? What was the transformational point that got those individuals to say, hey, you know, we're losing something here. We've got to work to bring it back. Well, I think, it, I, I think in each individual case, it's an individual case. Um, you know, whether Buffalo Jones was something of a braggart and, uh, you know, publicity hound. And so in his own words, it was a profound guilt of the role that he had played in the 1870s as a hide hunter that convinced him that he ought to try to rectify that blot on his character. I don't know. I, he was also very interested in publicity and making a buck. <laughs> Just and, a little. And, and, and his tenure as the game warden at Yellowstone was not a completely happy one because uh, he was still interested in more domesticating buffalo than the wild the wild herd. And still, you know, the, the superintendent wanted to fire him because he thought he was trying to commercialize things for himself and also was still too interested in crossbreeding than in the wild herd. So, and, and with, you know, I don't think they're, I'm not sure with Roosevelt whether there would be sort of an aha moment. I think that was probably a process. Charles Goodnight had sent in, he was a he's the old founder of a lot of cattle trails through what had been Buffalo Range. He he did not like Buffalo because they competed for grass. And when he opened his 
ranch in the Paladero Canyon in Texas. One of the things he did, there were still some buffalo, a few every now and then, you know, coming down into the canyon. And he hired his cowboys to go kill them and drive them out. And it was his wife. I guess he had an aha ha moment when his his wife Mary said, "You shouldn't be doing. You know, don't kill them all. Please capture a couple. You know, some some calves and let me start a small herd here. You know, for whatever her reasons were. You know, right. sympathy. I don't know. Right. Um, and then for good night, he then started said, okay, well." you know, Mary, yeah, we'll do that. And then he started thinking, well, maybe there's some money to be made for it. And then and then he also, as an old ex-Texas Ranger Indian fighter, donated uh, one of his uh, buffalo bulls to the Kiowas on their reservation who couldn't hold their sacred sun dance unless they had a buffalo bull to sacrifice. And they gave a number of Buffalo to the Taos Pueblo so they could have a small herd of their own because they need it for their ceremonies. He became a friend of Quana Parker of the Comanches who had fought and killed hide hunters and soldiers in the big sort of uh, the Red River War, which some people call the Buffalo War of the Southern Plains. Um, they became uh, friends eventually. So it's a, you know, it's it's uh we have a sign on our editing room wall neat little neon sign in cursive that ken had put up a number of years ago that that, that just says it's complicated <laughs> uh, you know that uh, and i think what we try to keep alive in all of our films are a couple things is uh first of all the contingencies of history that what we take for granted is not we shouldn't it's not inevitable that any of these things would have happened it's actually the result of people making personal decisions, groups making, pers- you know, larger decisions and governments finally making decisions. So we want to keep that alive. And we also think that any fair accounting of history needs to be clear eyed about, you know, the characters, you know, from history that they were not perfect people. They had their own uh, biases, prejudices, some of them really distasteful. And yet without in this case, some of those people with very distasteful racist thoughts, William T. Hornaday particularly, but Roosevelt as well, without them, the buffalo could very easily have gone extinct. So we try to keep all those things alive. And and while you have to simplify things I, uh, to a certain extent in terms of storytelling, we tell this thing in two two-hour episodes for PBS. So a lot of stuff that, uh, you know, that that I found interesting as a book writer, you know, falls to the editing floor. And when I start sobbing, Ken pats me on the shoulder and says, well, that can be in the in the book. And so I'm always happy, as in this case, to also write um, a companion book that allows me to get a lot of those things that weren't in the that aren't in the film. I'm not complaining about that. They aren't in the film. I understand the necessity of it. But I do also like to preserve those notions and present them in another format, which is a book. Absolutely. We're talking today with Dayton Duncan, who has been working with Ken Burns on a a new documentary, this one on the American buffalo. Uh, We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. The National Parks RVing Guide, the definitive guide for RVers seeking information on campgrounds in the National Park System where they can park their rigs, is now available through the Apple App Store as well as the Google Play Store. If you're an RVer who likes to explore the National Park System, you'll want to download this free app. Last year, we debuted this guide in ebook and PDF formats. Now, we've repackaged it as an app that not only lets you research National Park System campgrounds that can handle RVs, fifth wheels, trailers, and pickup campers, but which includes links to campsite reservation pages, park pages, and locator maps. This app is packed with RVing-specific details on more than 250 campgrounds in more than 70 parks. You can search by park name, by state, or by region of the country, and we point out campgrounds that can handle big rigs, those that are cell phone friendly, those with showers and dump stations, and those with ADA-accessible sites. We list nightly fees, the nearest town with fuel, and even elevations. 
You'll also find stories about RVing in the parks, some tips if you've just recently turned into an RVer, and some planning suggestions. A bonus that wasn't in the ebook or PDF are feeds of the Traveler content. You'll find our latest stories, as well as our most recent podcasts, just a tap away. So, whether you have an iPhone or an Android, you can download the National Parks RVing Guide and start exploring the campgrounds in the National Park System where you can park your rig. See you in the parks. Full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smokey's Life is a biannual magazine produced by Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokiesinformation.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Okay, we're back now with Dayton Duncan. Dayton, you know, you touched on it. The human onslaught against the bison was incredible. On one hand, as Gerard Baker points out in the film, native people used every part of the bison, even the wastes. You know, he was referring, of course, to the buffalo chips, um, the dried buffalo manure that was used as fuel for campfires. And, and bison were revered by native cultures. I mean, it seems like every culture, whether it's the Lakota or the Kiowa or the Comanche, had their own origin stories for bison, where the bison came from and what they meant to their culture. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at the heart of this um, story is the collision of two views of the human relationship to the natural world. And there's one that developed here in North America between indigenous people and not just the bison, but all of the natural world in which they did not see themselves as above it, but part of it, that the whole of it is sacred, uh, that in terms of the buffalo in particular, that while they relied on it for their physical survival and sustenance, using, as Gerard says, everything but the grunt, and even the grunt, the noises that they make were used in ceremonies uh, too, but at the same time that that's happening, becomes this kinship feeling uh, with them. And when buffalo might be hard to find, as they would be from time to time, their cosmologies taught them that we done we as human beings have done something wrong, and they're withholding themselves from us. As Scott Mamaday, the great Kiowa writer who's uh, in our film, uh, refers to it as that I will withhold myself from you. And so ceremonies had to uh, take place to say, okay, we've, uh, we've, we think we've learned our lesson and we've made a mistake here. And we want to make sure that you understand that we respect you. We rely on you. You are kin to us. And those were things that, you know, they would rely on to help quote, bring the Buffalo back. Well, starting in 1492, uh, newcomers to the continent started arriving, and they brought with them, you know, a very different view of that relationship. And then as it played out, as uh, uh, North America or the central part, main part of it at least, became the United States, that, you know, that view was uh, taken to the extreme, that this, you know, the whole natural world is beneath us and is only there for our use and particularly over time for our commercial use. And those that that collision, which you know began in 1492, but it reached its crescendo in the latter half of the of the 1800s on the Great Plains. And as Dan Flores, a great environmental historian who's also a consultant to our film, but also an interview in it, says, in recorded history, there is nothing that uh, to compare to the slaughter of 
animal life anywhere in the world that compares to what happened in the United States and particularly on the Great Plains in the across the 1800s. There's nothing that compares to it. And the elimination of its, you know, estimates vary of how many, uh, at the, uh, well, the estimate is that by the 1800s, uh, by 1800, there was roughly 30 million bison left on the Great Plains. That's still a lot. Um, and they once ranged all the way to uh, Florida. George Washington hunted bison on the Ohio River and, and tried wanted a couple of calves to be captured to bring to his Virginia plantation. You know, we get into that history in our film a little bit, but that was how extensive they went. And they went from the Atlantic coast to a little bit west of the Rocky Mountains. But in the 1800s, they were down to, you know, 30 million. And by the end of that, there were fewer than, you know, counting ones in zoos and private herds, there were fewer than uh 500, and in terms of free roaming ones, they were a couple hundred uh, in Yellowstone, supposedly under the protection of the federal government, which was ineffective. And so it got poachers got them down to a couple dozen. But it's that that collision of world views, or not world views, but views on our relationship to the natural world that played itself out to, to you know with great tragic results that is the first half of our film and the second half is how at least in this instance unlike the carolina parakeet and the passenger pigeon we made decisions that that kept this very as you call it as the park service loves to call it a charismatic megafauna you know they're exhibit a if you want to know that's the other thing that impelled me uh, so much to want to do this story um which i suggested to ken Oh, back in the 1980s, is that there's you know that there it's two ways it's it, it's a great prism to enter uh, American history, and it's a great prism for understanding who we are as a species, human species, and who we are as a as Americans. Are we capable of a nation to take this magnificent animal that once was in uncountable numbers down to Fewer than 500? Well, yes, we are. And here we tell that story. But are we also a people who sometimes, as we did with national parks, uh, in this case with this uh, great animal, capable of changing direction? And uh, I find that uh, a hopeful seed and a, and a almost inspiring story that if we, that Nothing is inevitable. It wasn't inevitable that the bison had to be slaughtered. A lot of decisions could have been made that would have changed that. But it also wasn't inevitable that they, you know, that we couldn't change direction, albeit, you know, at the near final moment and do something better. And I, that's, yes, we are that, we are those people too. We're that nation too. And I like to find those stories that give us that, both of those you know, both of those points. One of my favorite quotes, and you probably recognize it since you've seen the film, also appeared in our uh, National Parks film. Several of them do. But this one is by one of the great writers in, in American history, Wallace Stegner, who said, uh, we are the most dangerous species on the planet, and every other species has cause to fear our power to exterminate. But he added, I mean, that's a chilling thing. And when you think about it, that's, that's the story of us as a human species. But he added, we are also the only species that when it chooses to do so, he says, when it chooses to do so, will save what it otherwise might destroy. And in, in my mind, you know, I told Ken, when I put that one in the script, I said, well, this is basically the whole story. You know, we don't have to do a four hour film. We can just run that quote. And that's the point we're making. You know, you, you, you threw a lot out right there, Dayton. I'm, I'm trying to pace myself here. <laughs> but you mentioned the, the sheer contrast between how the Native Americans and the white cultures viewed 
the bison and and even how they viewed nature but you know you talk about the the slaughter you know while the the native americans treasured the bison as a, a spiritual as well as a, a food source um, there were the whites, um, many who killed bison and other wildlife for the fun of it. Um, you discuss in the film the trains that took paying passengers to shoot bison from the rail cars. And the Irishman who spent three years in the West killing wildlife, 4,000 bison, 1,500 elk, 2,000 deer, and even 500 bears. And then there was Buffalo Bill Cody, who was hired by the railroads to kill bison to feed the rail workers. You know, of course, he was so successful killing almost 4,300 bison for the Kansas Pacific Railroad, that he earned his nickname. And then the whole industrial revolution that, that played into the demise of the bison, that, you know, we don't need the meat, we just need the, the, the pelts, the, the hide to, to make um, factory belts. I mean, it really kind of exposes a, a flaw in the human species, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, it, it, you know, um, we are the most dangerous species on Earth. Because of our capacity of, of the uh, uh, among the many things of us as a species, our you know ingenuity, our capability of making tools and other things, we're also capable, therefore, of inflicting greater damage to the natural world than in any other species. You know, I, I think you know in the sort of larger scope of things. In terms of the demise of the American buffalo, uh, it, it becomes very clear early on that bison and American settlement just could not find a way to coexist. I mean, the, I, 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 the, the uh, one of the early Jamestown colonists went, you know, sailed up the Potomac and got off the off his ship uh, in what's now Washington, D.C., and and came across a herd of buffalo. The Georgia colonial legislature in 1757, I think it was, passed a law to make it illegal to kill buffalo in certain parts of the colony, mainly because of the troubles it was, you know, that was creating with them and the, and the native people of the area. The uh, Daniel Boone crossed uh, the Cumberland Gap, which is actually, a, as you mentioned, a buffalo trace, a road that the buffalo would take to go from one side of the Appalachian Mountains to the other. And when he got on the other side, on what's now Kentucky, he said, well, the, the buffalo here exist in numbers greater than the cattle back in Virginia. I mean, I, I you know, I guess I hadn't really focused on that, but they, so there were that there were there were buffalo that far east by 1800, roughly maybe a little bit after 1800, buffalo were essentially gone from east of the Mississippi. So that's where you get down to 30 million, which is sort of based on an estimate of what the carrying capacity of the Great Plains is. But then there was you know. Uh, there, it, there's a longer trail there because then it's uh, buffalo tongues and buffalo robes became fashionable in the East. And so Native people were encouraged to kill more buffalo than they needed for their subsistence because they could trade for the things that they wanted in exchange for a buffalo tongue and a buffalo robe that their, that the women would Repair and they were, you know, a million or so shipped out in four years of buffalo robes and who knows how many tongues. By the end of the Civil War, it's estimated there was probably 12 to 15 million still in the Great Plains. And that's then the railroads made it possible for more people to come, more people taking habitat for their ranches and their farms, but also this great new technological, uh, great, I, uh, but this advance in technology that said, oh, wait a minute, we've got to, we figured out a way that we can tan buffalo hides for use in the belts that run our machinery. And the tanners put out the call, we'll take as many as you can get. And thousands of men, you know, swarmed to the Great Plains on trains, 
spanned out across the prairies and they just started shooting buffalo as many as they as their skinners could skin in a day, which would be anywhere from 20 to 100 a day for one outfit. So in the space of that, in the 1870s to about 1883, it went from 15 million or 12 or 15 million to about 500. So it was the market economy uh, that made that possible. The, the demand for a resource that was insatiable and the notion that there is an unlimited resource out there on the plains, you know, with four legs and shaggy things and six or 800 pounds of meat, but we don't need the meat. We just want the hides and we leave the rest to, to rot on the prairie. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's a mind boggling to me every time I return to it, it's mind boggling me on two accounts. One is just the sheer logistics, you know, just sure, arithmetic, logistical, seeming impossibility of it. But yet it it happened. And then there's, you know, and, and then that doesn't even touch the moral magnitude of the of of how tragic it all is. It's it, 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 it's just a stupefying to me moment in our history. Um, and we're not the first to tell it, but I think we try to we try to make it clear of the both the extent of the slaughter, but also how profound it was for Native people. I mean, the government didn't say go out and kill. They didn't order the army to go kill them. They didn't they didn't order people to go do it. But they sort of approved of it. You know, yeah, there was it, a, it was a, we don't we don't need to do it because, look. You know, the market is taking care of it there, you know, and to the extent that the that the that the commissary, the Indian commissary, as they would have called it at that time, was disappearing um, at the same time that they were trying to do the final subjugation of um, of Plains tribes and put them on reservations and in the benighted view, you know, improve them by making them farmers. This staggering number of majestic beasts were just left to rot on the prairies. It's yeah. it, it's 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 hard to get your mind around sometimes, but it happened. And and as I say, we 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 try to make that as clear and as fair an accounting as as we can. It, it's it's hard to say, and this one person's to blame. We all were, you know, in that in, in that instance, we were all to blame, right? Um, we uh, the government wasn't actively doing it; it was just sort of standing by. The one thing it actively did is did, did not enact laws and regulations to prevent it from happening. Which it did pass the House and Senate one time in 1874, and President Grant um, Paco vetoed it. Right. You mentioned the Secretary of the Interior. It's it's interesting to me in that in that time period, Columbus Delano, who was the Secretary of the Interior when this law was coming forward, said I would I would not regret at all the elimination of the bison herds on the Great Plains because of the benefit it would have with us with with the with the Indians, um, and I'm uh, I can't. Uh, imagine, though there's no paper trail of it, that that view uh, wasn't expressed to the president uh, when he decided not to sign the bill that had passed and Congress adjourned, and therefore that had the effect of a veto. It's interesting, that was 1874. Now, the Secretary of the Interior is herself a Native American, and the C official seal of the Interior Department whose secretary once said he wouldn't mind at all if all the buffalo were gone, on the official seal of the Department of Interior is a bison with a rising sun behind it, hopefully not a setting sun. Um, and um, I mean, that just those two touch points, you know, are very interesting to me uh, in my interest of, of who we are as Americans and what our history is and can be uh, and might be. Yeah. We're talking today with Dayton Duncan about a 
forthcoming documentary that he and Ken Burns have been putting together on the American Buffalo. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Potrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with the breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. Dayton, backing up a little bit, um, it might not have been official government policy to, to wipe out the bison, but I, I recall in my research that um, there were some in the, the military, a nod and a wink, you know, let's let's get rid of these animals because that'll force the, the native cultures on the reservations. And I, yeah. and I believe they offered free ammunition to the, the buffalo hunters, the hide hunters, to go out there and kill as many yeah, as, can, as possible. Yeah, you um... I mean, there's some, there's that famous speech, uh, so-called speech by Phil Sheridan to the Texas legislature, kill all of them, you, you know, the, these people, these hide hunters are your heroes. Well, that never occurred. That was a hide hunter later writing his memoirs that, you know, it sort of was trying to say, well, the government told us to do it. Uh, but that, that certainly didn't occur. There's, you can get into arguments with some uh, historians about the free ammunition. I, I, I tend to I, I tend to think that it was uh, it, it probably happened in a number of places. The army certainly didn't actively stop uh, violations of treaties that allowed the hide hunters to go down to the uh, southern plains. There were a number of uh, high officials in the War Department and in, in the Army that thought the sooner these things are gone, the better it will be. There were also, however, officers who wrote to Congress when they were working on this protection bill that said, you, do, you need to stop the slaughter. This is going to be, this is going to create more violence on the Great Plains than quell it. Uh, and some that just thought it was, it was just a disgrace point blank and therefore uh, sh should be stopped. So there's, you know, there's, there's some disputes on certain facts. It's very clear that a lot of people high up in the government and in the army uh, saw the connection between the disappearance of the bison and the ability, uh, the greater ability by the U.S. government to confine native people who had been pursuing buffalo for you know tens of uh, 10,000 years that it would make it easier to subjugate them so i think that's that that larger point is certainly true just how complicit individual members of the military were and others that uh, people can dispute but the but the the main thing is having had the chance to to say we've got to stop now the federal government certainly didn't uh, when it had the chance. Sure. You know, as much as the film is around a title about the history of the American buffalo, it could just as easily be a film about um, the genocide of the, of the native cultures, no? I mean, um, you bring in lots of indigenous voices to portray the value of the bu buffalo, both spiritually and as a source of food and shelter, tools and weapons, I suppose, and you chronicle how whites saw a way to wipe out the native peoples by wiping out their commissaries, as you put it. And then, you know, sitting bull statement, a cold wind blew across the prairie 
when the last buffalo fell, a death wind for my people. It could just as easily be a, a film about the genocide of Native cultures, no? Yes, absolutely. I mean, one of the things, um, as I said earlier, to me, the the story of the American buffalo, the biography, if you will, is also a portal to larger parts of uh, or and other parts of American history. My my good friend Gerard Baker, who had a long storied career with the National Park Service, is the one who really, from the time I first met him in the early 1980s, when he was just at the lowest ranks of the of the Park Service at that time, over the years, is the one that really taught me this and inculcated into me of, of how intertwined the two were, the Buffalo and the particularly the Plains Indians. It, it's just, you can't, you, you can't, they didn't see it. it they, they, they saw no separation themselves on it and they were correct. And, and they were correct. And so when you're dealing with, um, if, if you're eliminating the Buffalo, <laughs> the extent of that impact, that tragic consequence, goes hand in hand. And and we, you know, even with the ghost dance, they are trying to sing the buffalo back and the return of the and the return of the old ways, you know, in their in the 18, in 1890. It's sort of the lowest point in American history for the American Indians. That was part of what that movement was about because because they they just you can't you cannot separate that and you cannot tell the story of the American buffalo without coming to grips with that not just coming to grips with it but also trying what we hope people will get across from this is that is just how deep that is it's not it's easy just to say well it was you know they were reliant on it and everything but until you finally really I think come to a greater understanding of the depth of that connection. Not just, be, you know, it, it, it's not just you're taking away a food source, you're taking away a, a spirit. And every, uh, we, uh, we have a lot of different native, um, native uh, interviewees in it, some descendants of Quanta Parker, Gerard Baker, Rosalind LaPierre, who's an ethnobiologist, but uh, Matisse and uh, Blackfeet, uh, Jermaine White, who's uh, up in uh, the Flathead Reservation and been uh, active in the restoration of the of the tribe, taking over the National Bison Range, uh, Scott Mamaday, uh, the Kiowa poet, uh, all of whom are this chorus of voices, many others um, as well that I didn't name. To help us, you know, I can say it, but I, I can't adequately communicate the depth of it and the importance of it the way that they can. Uh, Richard White, who was the founding director of the American Museum of the uh, National Museum of the American Indian, and now is uh, retired, but he's a uh, the director emeritus of that. He's a um, Stanford giant. professor, right? Uh, he was actually uh, not a professor, but he he, he was uh, involved in in creating that uh, the National Museum of the American Indian, Washington D.C., and been active in many Native uh, causes and stuff. He's a lawyer, actually, uh, but he was uh, the senior advisor for our film. Uh, a number of our advisors, besides the interviewees, are Native people. Um, Juliana Branham, who's um, part of the Comanche. People, um, a filmmaker, uh, is a consulting producer on it. Uh, we we really wanted to make sure that we were informed by them and how we structured it, but even more importantly, that in the presentation of, of this um, epic story, that we felt it. Mm -hmm. and uh, And by asking for their help, um, 
I think we did a better, you know, we did a better job than we might, than we otherwise could have. Sure, sure. Those voices are definitely important and they bring a lot of, and also a lot of weight to them. And also, as you quoted from Sitting Bull, we, you know, as we do in all of our films, we like to bring the past more to life by using the words of the people whose story we're telling. And so you not only hear from George Bird Grinnell, but you hear from Sitting Bull and you hear from Quanah Parker and you hear from different voices, uh, uh, a woman, uh, Kiowa woman by uh, uh, named Old Lady Horse, who tells the story of the disappearance of the bison and the slaughter that was going on in the 1870s. To, to the extent that we can populate the story properly, mm -hmm. which is, it's, and, and it's not just a Native American story, it's a all Americans story, it's just that the native part of that, you know, is the deeper history, and then is also then the contemporary history. I mean, the, then the historical story is theirs is theirs as well. And we just had to make sure that 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 we had that um, that balance. Right, right. You know, you mentioned earlier the Stegner quote: "We are the most dangerous species on Earth. Our power to exterminate, and yet we also." are the only species that will go to great effort to save another species. And certainly we're seeing that now. I mean, there was a, a movement at the end of the 19th century going into the 20th to make sure they didn't go extinct. And in the past uh, couple decades, you know, I think there's really been a concerted effort to, to save, save the bison, um, the American buffalo. And it's not just the white cultures. You know, there's so much effort with getting the indigenous cultures to, to play a role in that. And as, as you mentioned in the, the film, I think, um, 80 tribes in 20 states have herds. Uh, the National Bison Range in Montana, that was established with the help of the American Bison Society and William Hornaday back in the early 19 aughts, is managed today by the Confederated Salish and the Kootenai tribes. And then, of course, up uh, uh, the Fort Peck Reservation, you have the tribes there getting bison from Yellowstone that haven't fully been cleared of brucellosis to finish that um, testing period for the bison and then spreading them across um, other tribal nations. Yeah, it's a, it's an, it's an exciting uh, story. I, I, Ken and I and Julie Dunphy, who is the producer like to refer to the, the, the say that the, the story of the American Buffalo could be um, described as a three act play. And we're concentrating on the first two acts. The first act being how deep their relationship is and was with native people and all of what that meant, the arrival of the newcomers, ultimately resulting in their near extinction. That's act one, from here and then down. Act two is in the late, uh, you know, basically the first couple decades uh, or so of the of the 20th century, the different individual efforts ultimately resulting in a national effort to save them from extinction. By 1933, the American Bison Society and William Hornaday said, they're safe now from extinction. Our job is done. And that's pretty much where we end our, you know, TikTok uh, storytelling. But as a sort of coda to it, we try to make sure that people understand there is an act three, and that is not just saving them from extinction, but returning them in greater numbers in larger areas, and particularly returning them and restoring their connection to native people. And that's a very exciting thing that's going on today. Because we deal with history and not current journalism, you know, we 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 make sure that people know that that's happening at the end, but we don't know how that's going to turn out and our hope is is that our film gives you a a bigger historical base of, of information, if you will, to, 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 to have a greater comprehension of just how important that is, mm -hmm. you know, for the species, 
certainly that they can increase in greater numbers for the Great Plains and the, and the other uh, ecosystems that if they're returned on larger places where they can roam the way that they had, that, you know, obviously they're not going to cover the, cover the entirety of the Great Plains, but in, into larger landscapes also has a profound effect on that landscape. But just as important, if not some in some ways more importantly, is the restoration of them on reservations by the native people themselves who have a lot of knowledge about the bison accumulated by 600 generations of interaction with them, but also how profoundly important that is to them for their own spirit. You know, in doing this film, virtually every native person that we interviewed talked about the thing in the of the uh, of the Indians' view of that. Look what they did to the bison. What they did to the bison. They being the white folks did the bison. It's the same thing they did to us. They cut our numbers down. They can find find us in the bison's case to zoos. In our case, to reservations. They did their damnedest to, to, if not exterminate us, at least not let us be what we felt we should be, you know, crossbreeding, you know, saving the bison uh, by crossbreeding the cattle is, you know, not really, not really doing that. And trying to, quote, save the Indian, uh, as the, the people who call themselves friends of the Indians wanted to do by changing them into something other than what they were is the is the same thing so so restore it and for many of them what they wanted to make sure that we understood is that they're like the bison resilient they weren't exterminated they're still here they still have a culture they still have this connection and to the extent that now, through these different efforts with the Intertribal Buffalo Council and, and the Department of the Interior now joining in on it, very exciting things of, you know, um, of Buffalo returning to, to their places. Juliana Branham, who I, I mentioned, who's a Native American filmmaker and was a consulting producer on our on our historical film is also uh, doing about a 15, 20 minute short film that focuses just entirely on uh, uh, and, and more some personal stories and stuff about this restoration effort on a couple of reservations, which we will uh, have on our website. And we hope that, you know, we'll have also uh, a broader reach than, than that. So that's the, you know, um, we always, uh, when we did national parks, you know, we were gratified, I guess is the right word, that so many people who watched it came away from it saying, oh, I, you know, I want to make sure that our kids get to go see some of these places. And at least according to the Park Service, had an impact on their visitation. In the one case, that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always a, a second, you know, a second side to all, uh, all those things. But anyway, we're we're always grateful that our films reach, you know, tens of millions of people sometimes prompts them to say, I want to go where that history occurred, or I want to read more about that particular thing, or I now want to be more involved in those things. And my hope is with with this one that people will bring from it this greater uh, heartfelt understanding of why this uh, act three of the restoration on reservations is, is so vitally important, I think. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what uh, goes forward. Uh, it's been a fascinating story. As you and said, over 10,000 years. Said, in Yellowstone, you know, uh, Yellowstone's role in the history, you know, following the story of the, um, you know, the bison of the American buffalo leads you to the story of, of Yellowstone as well. I mean, Yellowstone, it's interesting, Kurt, that, um, you know, Yellowstone wasn't set aside to be the last refuge for 
the, the species. It was set aside as a more or less as a geological oddity, as a potential tourist place for the railroads. So there were a lot of those kind of things were what drove uh, some nationalism. You know, we got to show Europe that we've got some special places too uh, that we're not, you know, despoiling. Um, and that's what drove that. An unintended consequence of it, however, was that at a critical moment in time in American history, when what had once been 30, maybe even farther back, 60 million majestic animals were down to you know fewer than 500, the only free roaming ones were in this place that had been set aside because of its geysers and its beautiful waterfalls. And that place was Yellowstone. And, you know, Yellowstone had these other unintended consequences, all for the good, as, you know, as well in that respect. But that's a, a, a really um, critical one. And now it is, the, it is a place that can be a seedbed for you know, as as they have troubles with the both the carrying capacity of its within its borders and the other problems they have with Montana and others of uh, that Buffalo do want to go to where they can eat. The problems that that creates that one of the solutions to that can be part of this wonderful effort to restore the species back to the Great Plains and beyond to native people who, you know, who've been waiting for them for a hundred years to come back. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, an incredible story and it's going to be interesting to see um, act three, as you describe it. Dayton, thanks so much for joining me today. It's a, a wonderful film and, and it'll be interesting to see if it, it spurs some national introspection on how we view and deal with wildlife. Uh, yeah, well, let's hope it does. But before that, that can occur, we, we hope a lot of people watch. Uh, it's going to be on on October 16th and 17th on every PBS station in the nation and be repeated and streamed and all those things. And, and then I have a companion book that will be coming out in November as well that hopefully if people are looking for more information besides the books of the experts that are in our film, there's one that tells the story the way that we tell it. Great, great. Looking forward to it. Okay. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Dayton. That was Dayton Duncan, who has been working with Ken Burns on a documentary, The American Buffalo. Watch for it on your local PBS station in October. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repinjack. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.